Paul. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me on again. This, this is almost becoming a habit. Right? This is like a couple in a row now, I think. It's like at <laughs> least two or three. You know, when, like... you, when you keep coming back, you'd think that people would remember you, which leads into our first topic. I was, uh, I was using PayPal the other day, and I logged in, you know, did my thing, um, logged back out, and then I got an email from PayPal, and PayPal was like, hey, we noticed that you logged in on this computer and you've done it before. So we're going to remember you and automatically log you in every time you start your computer up. And I was like, ah, oh, PayPal, really? Right. <laughs> like it's polite when someone recognizes you, but when the computer automatically logs you in, like I stay logged out for a reason. I want to not be logged in so that I have to type my password in every time so that when my kids are on the computer, they can't accidentally purchase the entire stock of Amazon's Nerf guns or whatever. Right. So, like, I I intentionally don't want it to log me in. So I'm like, okay. And, it, and at the bottom of the email, it's like, if you want to change your settings, click on this button. And so I click on the button and I'm like, no, disable auto login for this computer. Good. Problem solved. Except the next time I log in on a different computer, it's like, hey, we noticed you logged in. And so we're going to automatically log you in. I was like, no, stop it. So I <laughs> no. go in there, I turn it off again. And then I go and log in on my work computer because I'm buying something at work. And hey, we're going to log in. No, stop. Is there a way to tell you to not ever log me in automatically? No, that's not a setting. Because they know that accidental purchases are a thing and that it's harder to work yourself up to not, you know, to going in and canceling it or whatever than it is to just automatically log you in and then maybe you won't maybe you won't cancel it and spend more money than you meant to it's like man it's so it's so sleazy right oh i found a way to increase our you know our profits by two percent not by delivering better service but just like deliberately exploiting human frailty and just making the world worse and like i would be more upset at this except that like Microsoft have been doing this forever. Like in Windows 10, when you log right. into Windows 10, if you use an, an account, if you use an account that's linked to a Microsoft email account, then it'll automatically just connect all those pieces up. And then all of your, you'll very conveniently have all of your systems connected to your Microsoft Windows login, and you'll be able to access your email and all of your files on the Google, or not the Google, on the Microsoft cloud or whatever. And like, Except I don't want any of that. I I do have a very old Hotmail account, but I don't want Windows to associate my Hotmail account with my Windows login. I want to keep those separate. I want I want compartmentalization. Yeah. And so like I just don't have a password on my computer. I'm just like, no, I'm not gonna log in with anything. No logging in. Don't don't bother me with security. Like I I wanna keep these things airtight. Right. For me, that's a big deal because if it's something I type in over the internet, it's a big, complicated, multi-case, multi-symbol password. It's not something I remember. It's something I use a password manager for. But if it's turning on my friggin' computer so I can start work for the day, I don't want to type in a nuclear launch code to just begin <laughs> right. work. And I don't want to get locked out of my computer. It, your computer startup password needs to be low security. You do not want to type a monstrosity on your home computer that sits in your home office and nobody in the outside world ever interacts with, right? This computer yeah. is protected by the locks on my house. And, and the it, occupancy of your house. Right. So I don't want a big password, but I don't want an online password that's, you know, just like three characters long or whatever. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't want a complicated password on my computer like oh i have a you know i fall down and go to the hospital or something and then while i'm in the hospital my family needs something off my computer and nobody can log into it because <laughs> the password's this monstrous thing and plus i yeah. get to my password manager through my computer so if i got locked out of my computer i couldn't get to my password manager right. so i microsoft's PC login has always been horrible since Windows 10. It's always the worst of both worlds. It's just confuses local security with online security, which you should never do. They are different kinds of security with different needs in different situations. Yeah. So then I got an email from Microsoft and they're like, hey, thanks for purchasing the Minecraft pack thing. And I was like, 
dang it, Microsoft, did you leave me logged in? Did you automatically log me into my my account so that my kids could like purchase a Minecraft thing? It was like you know twenty nine bucks, and like okay. 29 bucks is not a big deal, but it's the principle of the thing. Yes, it is the principle of the thing. So I'm going in there, I'm like, okay, well, can I cancel this? No, there's no way to cancel it. Well, can, can I get a refund? Like, I already have Microsoft Windows 10 edition, and, and this is just like a bunch of add-ons, like skins and, and map packs and stuff. And well, I'm sure they're cool. I don't want to pay 30 bucks for that. Like... How do I get out of this? And so I, right. I finally, you can't There's get to it. There's infinity of of that stuff available for <laughs> yeah. for the Java edition for free. Right. So I, I thought it was because it had automatically logged me in. Turns out, no, I don't know how it got purchased. So I I managed to hack my way with a machete into an interface where I could tell them, hey, I I want a refund and. To be fair, they refunded me within a day. So, like, props for reversing it. Um, nice. Would have been better if it hadn't happened in the first place. But, right. yeah, a little weird. It's, it's weird when computers are too helpful. Speaking of which, speaking of too helpful, you might remember months ago, uh, my computer ran Windows Update. And I was like, okay, that's I'd lost a whole day of productivity. Never again. I don't care. I'm going to up I'm going to update either never or like once a year or something. I don't need like every 2 months my computer blows up. Bullshit. <laughs> right. So I just every time it's like oh it's time to update, I'm like there's a button you can press delay for 7 days and I'll just press it a dozen times and, you know, push it ahead several months. And I did that recently. And it was like, okay, you're, you know, your next update's going to be March 2021. I'm like, great. And then later that day, I went to reboot my machine and, and it was like, yeah, applying updates. And I'm like, mm -hmm. so they got me, ah. they, they got me. And sure enough, it broke an install of like some old software. Like it was installed and running fine, but it was like, you know, Windows... XP edition of some software and that broke and I have to reinstall that so that's annoying but the other thing that broke is now all the fonts on my system look weird have you ever turned off clear type I don't even know what that is all right uh, clear type is smoothing on the edges of fonts it actually allows um, windows oh, it's to like anti-aliasing very much so. It allows Windows to use sub-pixels. Like you've got three, oh, I forget what they're called. The three color el elements, like red, green, and blue, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're arranged mm -hmm. beside each other. If you, you know, look at the oh. screen under a microscope. And they're probably and always arranged in the same way on all the screens, like there's an industry standard or something. Right. So it can use like one of those. So technically this pixel is red, but you don't see it as red. You just see it as the black line is slightly thicker and it works great until you zoom in on it. If you turn it off, then you'll get all these weird artifacts and like fonts look bad. I'm not convinced this didn't used to be a problem before clear type was a thing. Fonts looked fine, but then once clear type was introduced, everything looked janky without it. And I was always a little bit suspicious of that. But anyway, now all the fonts look a little weird on my system. And I've gone through, made sure clear type is on, looked at the fonts, looked at the resolution, checked all the obvious stuff. Nothing's changed. It's just Windows updated. And for no reason, now everything looks like it's being rendered at like some lower resolution or something like just weird like you know an e will be the a lowercase e will have the interior interior part almost filled in so it's just solid black up top it'll be like one white hmm. pixel and it's like it's it looks wrong that that's it you know like so <laughs> like the computer has a, a leaky pen <laughs> just like too much ink here not enough there <laughs> like, what? Oh, why well, did you break it's so strange. You, and, 
and I looked through the the new features, and it was all a bunch of bullshit for Microsoft Edge, which is why I'm I'm sure they forced it on me. And of course, when I rebooted, it had a big full screen. Hey, you're not using Edge. Let's get you started. And you know the the dark pattern where it's like, how the fuck do I dismiss this without you stealing my without you reassigning my browser? My default web browser. There was actually I was I was sat there for 30 seconds looking for a button. The answer was there is no button. Press the escape key. Ugh. And so I just I just wanted to punch somebody. <laughs> I know. It's like every once in a while Windows updates and it's like full screen, like you said, full splash screen thing. It's like, hey, it looks like you've finished setting up Windows. Let's get your final adjustments done. I'm like, man, I've been using this computer for a year. Like, how 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 do you get around to thinking that right. I need to finish setting up my computer? You just made a mess of my computer. You finished setting it up. Oh, and I just noticed I've got a new button on my taskbar, which I curate, you know, religiously. I am extremely picky about what gets added to my taskbar, but now I have a meet now button for setting up hosting video calls and joining <laughs> meetings and, you know, like, what the fuck do I... Why would you put this on here by default? You just want me to use your bullshit software. How dare you? And now I've got to figure out how to get rid of this button. And you just right click and click hide. Oh, you're right. Open me now or hide. But it's always running. Mm-hmm. What if someone but wants to call okay. you? So basically, screw Microsoft. They are awful. I mean they've been this they've been doing this kind of crap for twenty years at least. But oh I just it's so tiresome. It is so bad. I began having this daydream where, like, what if you could steal the source code for Windows and just post it, just dump it online, you know, put it up on the torrents, and uh, and let all the and let all the hackers. Is this like have a Lovecraftian daydream where, like, it infects the internet and people's computers start changing into eldritch colors and? Well, no. If you had the source, it would be easier to make alternatives. For somebody mm. to fork it, for instance, or for somebody to edit Linux in a way, or to, to add to Linux in a way, you know, get through all of the layers of obfuscation and make Linux able to run, better able to run um, Windows programs, especially games. Like, every time this happens, I'm mm. like, oh, I wish I could switch to Linux. Oh, but I can't, I can't cover games. And no, I don't want to, like switch back and forth. Okay, I'm done playing a video game. Now I'll reboot into Linux so that I can do my writing. Oh, now I gotta <laughs> reboot it back into the game. Like, that doesn't work. That That's silly. Uh, I alt-tab back and forth now. Right. Well, you can always have another computer, I guess, for your writing, but it seems a little excessive. Right, it does. And I, they need to be able to share stuff. Like, I capture footage fire up a game, capture a screenshot, I want to hit Alt-Tab and immediately use that screenshot and throw it in an article. You know what I mean? Mm, yeah. Like, I need my gaming machine to also be my productivity machine because the two are so intertwined. <sighs> Makes me angry. Let's do some mailbags. Yes, let's. Dear DieCast, when talking horror video games, I feel Shalebridge Cradle is fading away from public memory. Before, I often saw it mentioned, but lately not. Now, I do think it isn't all bad because part of what makes it so scary is that you don't expect it. By the time you realize you're in a horror level, the door is already locked behind you and you're about to experience some high-octane terror. So my question is, how do you talk a horror fan into playing Thief Deadly Shadows without spoiling the surprise? Um, and also, how do I feel about the consolification of Deadly Shadows? With kind regards, Chris. Thank you, Chris. You haven't played this game, have you, Paul? I I think I may have watched someone play, like, not a, a Let's Play, but like actually stood in the room with them and watched them play it. But hmm. uh, no, I have not played it myself. Uh... Yeah, so to spoil this, just so that we can discuss it, we have to spoil it. So the third Thief game is called Thief Deadly Shadows. And it's a regular Thief game. You're mostly slinking around in the dark, robbing people, knocking out guards and that. But there's one level 
where you go to an insane asylum and it is literally haunted and it's, it's not an asylum for insane people it's an asylum which is itself insane yeah yeah the the place itself is a malevolent evil presence and horrible things happen there and it doesn't want you to leave and it's people have often called it one of the scariest video game levels ever and a big part of that is because you don't see it coming like when you play a horror game you're like okay the game is going to try and scare me i expect to be scared now and that expectation sort of you're already prepared for uncanny things to happen and you have this meta knowledge that whatever the game throws at you, you're going to be able to deal with it. But right. in the Shale Bridge Cradle, you feel like a regular thief that's been caught in a, a Cthulhu-style horror story. And you feel ill-equipped and you don't know, you know what you can do here. Like... Oh my goodness, can I sneak past these creatures? Should I? I just want to leave. And so, one, it's not trying to keep up that level of terror for the whole game. It's very hard to keep somebody just scared for the entire 12 hours they're playing a game. But you could make two hours in the middle of that game really scary. So people don't see it coming. And the other thing about it is I think... Um, stealth mechanics are uniquely suited to horror. Everybody keeps trying to take action combat and make it into horror, but action combat is inherently empowering and horror should be depowering. So it hmm. is much easier and smarter to make horror... The, your natural response when you're actually scared is run away and hide. Um, if you're faced with something that's bigger and stronger that you cannot fight. But if you try that in an action game and the player has a gun, they're not going to go, oh, I should go run and hide. They're going to like, well, I'll use my, my one verb is shoot. So I'm going to use right. shoot on monster. And it isn't super effective. And then they're like, oh, this is bullshit. It's immune to everything. This game sucks. And instead of being scared, they just feel like the rules changed and it's lame. Yeah, yeah. Whereas Thief is kind of uniquely suited for that kind of thing. And I, I seem to recall, um, what was that other? Dishonored? Yeah, Dishonored was super empowering, though. Like, it oh, was like Thief. But it did have some stealth plus, elements in it, right? It did. They were not scary. It was never scary, though. It even mm. tried to do supernatural stuff, but it was just. You were, you were a force of nature in that thing. Yeah. I wonder if you could make, like, Cooking Mama into a horror thing. The other thing about the consolization of Thief, and that's kind of heartbreaking, is yes, it was a whole, it was one of the early cross-platform titles, just when that was a, a newish thing. Hmm. And yeah, I think Halo was really, really... in that same, or was it Halo after that? Uh, I don't remember the lineage of Halo. Um, I mean, this was definitely after Halo. This would have been, I think, 2003. Hmm. But the point is that um, it's heartbreaking because the a lot of the, the first two Thief games were built around huge levels and deadly shadows because it was had to go on the consoles and that particular generation this was the xbox one generation xbox one ps2 were very short on memory compared to the pc like really starved for memory and that really made the levels very very tiny uh deus ex invisible war was very much the same problem just all right. these teeny tiny closet sized levels and it was heartbreaking because you know this is something that this series had done really well it would be like a mario title in a on a on a platform where the controls are really unresponsive but it you know a, a title built around tight platforming jumps it's like oh this is like the worst case for this genre 
And despite all those accommodations they made for the console players, they went out of business anyway. Right? Right. It was heartbreaking. And you can't really, like, I don't know. I, I found it very frustrating. I, at the time, I was just infuriated that, hey, why are you going to the console players? Then a few years later, it became clear why. Because the consoles were really becoming more pro like the audience there was so much larger right and games were becoming more expensive to make and so they're like well we have to keep mindlessly upping the production values and how can we possibly pay that the only way we could do that <laughs> is by going to the consoles um yeah so it was all it was all unfortunate and heartbreaking okay Windows 10 is the shale bridge cradle of operating systems. Got it. <laughs> right. Dear Seamus, oh, dear Seamus, in your Happy New Year's post, you mentioned that you considered The Founder to be one of your favorite action movies of the 2010s. I was wondering if you could go into more detail about your thoughts on the film and how you felt about the events in it. I admit I'm asking this question because I find biographical stories where people screw each other over to be very compelling. And I was interested in hearing your thoughts about one of these kind of stories. Best regards. ICUP. Thank you, ICUP. All right, so the first thing I have to make it clear is that this is not an action movie. I realized the original question was, what are your favorite action movies? But I kind of expanded the question to just favorite movies. The Founder has absolutely zero action in it. I mean, none. Not only are there, like, no gunfights or car chases, but there aren't even any scenes where someone's in a hurry. There isn't even somebody that has to elbow through a crowd in a hurry. This is an incredibly slow-paced story. Having said that, I have to give a content warning, all right? There is some extreme stuff in this biopic. Um, in this movie, they you will see completely uncensored, you will see Nick Offerman without facial hair. What? Um, that's, How can they that's show that? Obviously, I know. They showed that. There wasn't even a content warning at the beginning, and that's obviously very shocking and disturbing, and some people will find that site very traumatic. So just, if you watch the movie, you're going to see Nick Offerman without, not even a mustache. So, whew. <laughs> anyway, the point, the, it's a very interesting movie. Nick Offerman plays one of the McDonald's brothers. And Michael Keaton plays Ray Kroc. According to the movie, and I'd heard this before, I, you know, I worked in McDonald's um, in the early 90s, so I knew who Ray Kroc was. He's the founder. He's the founder of McDonald's, except he's basically the guy that stole the idea of McDonald's from the McDonald's brothers, even though he didn't need to. They willingly hmm. gave him a tour of their place. They... In a lot of ways, they invented a lot of innovations in fast food. Before this, a lot of so-called fast food places would bring your food on a plate with utensils. And you had to hang it on the car window, right? Like, that was your... Yeah. You were eating dinner in your car. And it was frustrating. And, you know, the, that's not a comfortable way to eat. And they came up with... with what we have now, which is the fast food pipeline where you can mass produce burgers very, very quickly using specialized tools. So you're not, you don't have a chef back there doing orders one at a time and you're not sitting in your car for 20 minutes waiting for somebody to cook you dinner. You just order one of the hamburgers that's already there and waiting for you. Yeah. And they showed, I don't know, I don't um, know what kind of, I don't know what kind of uh, fast food people are familiar with, but. I am always shocked at how very fast McDonald's is. Like, even among fast food, I'll, I'll go in, order my food, like, go to the bathroom to wash my hands, and by the time I get out of the bathroom, the food's ready. I mean, it's that fast. You can order online and say, like, check in in the parking lot, and by the time you get in the front door, your food's ready. It's insane. It was even more insane back in the 50s. Because they only had a couple of menu items. They had like hamburgers, cheeseburgers, french fries, and I think one other thing. So the food was always just... Every order was like 10 seconds. 
It was, oh, wow. you walk up, order, pay, and they hand you your food that fast. <laughs> and uh, one of the problems with modern day McDonald's is every time you add an item onto the menu, you slow things down. You could still have this today. Right. I believe for years, the uh, I don't have Sonic fast food around here. Um, but people have told me, well, that's what Sonic does. It's like the old McDonald's where they've only got a few menu items and your food's ready right away. And then somebody else told me, no, it's not like that a anymore. They've got some other business focus they're doing now. But I don't know because I've never been to a, a Sonic firsthand. Even though I'd love to, I think they're only in the Southwest. California to Texas, yeah. I think. I have been to several Sonic burgers and, and the times that I have gone have not been astounding um but hmm. you can also have like a small menu like uh in and out burger has a very limited menu but also it takes a little while to get your food because i think just because they're so busy all the time interesting well the story in the founder and i don't want to spoil the whole movie um but the idea is they showed ray Kroc around the restaurant ray Kroc, and they didn't make him sign an nda he was just like a salesman and they were like hey you know you want to tour the place? Just being sort of friendly, fellow people in the restaurant biz. Shook hands and they're like, hey, let's give you a tour. And they were giving them a tour because these guys were basically engineers and they were proud of what they built. Right, right. And they didn't care. They didn't want to scale up. They just made one really, really good restaurant and that's what they wanted to do is want, run a single really good restaurant. But Ray immediately recognized this as a result as a revolution and he could have gone off and start his own restaurant based on these same principles could have been crock burgers or whatever but no he he wanted to make a franchise and he sort of like twisted their arm talked them into it strung them along he kept expanding and expanding and expanding and he owned all of these franchise restaurants of McDonald's and the brothers didn't want to grow and eventually, he was t still technically there like a franchisee. And normally, it's the giant corporation and you're a tiny franchisee, right? Like, that's how it works yeah, now. If you, yeah. if you have a McDonald's restaurant, you own one restaurant and the corporation owns 12,000. Actually, it was 12,000 back in 1991. I remember them, like, sending out a, a memo. It was like, hey, we just crossed 12,000. So who knows where it is today? They might have 12,003 by now. <laughs> so so that's the way the asymmetry goes, is a franchisee is a spec compared to the corporation. But in this case, it was reversed because the corporation was just two guys running a single restaurant and the franchisee was trying to cover the map. <laughs> he was just expanding as fast as he could in every direction. And he used that power again and again, and you really do hate Ray Kroc by the end. Like, I admire... Don't paint him in a very good light, huh? No, it does not paint him at all in a good light. He comes off as just a very narrow-minded, very selfish, very petty man. And it was interesting, mm. it was just like, he was smart enough to see that this was a revolution, but he didn't have enough creativity to, like, make up his own restaurant. Which I'd like to think almost everybody could do. <laughs> like, how many people don't, wouldn't love the freedom to, like, oh boy, I could make up my own restaurant and, th like, he wanted, no, it has to be called McDonald's and it has to ha have the golden arches. Like, he wasn't so willing weird. to do anything. Like, yeah. his creativity was so low that he's just like, if I change anything, it might break, so I'll just leave it all alone. Right. So, But it's there's a lot to it, and it's both fascinating and heartbreaking. And if you're okay with seeing Nick Offerman without a mustache, I very much recommend it. All right. Hi, Seamus and Paul. Hopefully it's been a good and, and virus-free week for you, too. It has. Thank you. My question concerns ARPGs and related topics. Okay, as an aside, I read this and it took me a while to figure out what they meant by ARPGs. This is action RPGs. 
And I was like, wait, ARPG? Like, there are so many... There are so many different kinds of RPGs now. They're like Pokemon. Like, there's new ones coming out all the time. Basically, everything's an RPG now. Right. It's infected everything. Right. When was the last time I played a game where you didn't level up? Which is what they mean when they slap RPG on stuff. Like, even Action RPG. Action RPG is a label that gets used for games with random drops. Which means Diablo and... Um, Borderlands. The the key feature is the random drops, the slot machine, and that is not reflected in action RPG. Like, all no. RPGs are re action RPGs now. Like, every game's an action RPG. Uh. Anyway, back to the question. Personally, I've, en I've enjoyed various titles in the genre, but I have been getting more and more annoyed at how certain mechanics seem to be included in these games by default especially tacked on linear difficulty progression and random loot systems are two pet peeves of mine. Both seem like bad design to me. Shadow Warrior 2 especially has recently provided me with a good example of why random loot can be bad. Long story short, random loot is rarely exciting, often annoying to constantly micromanage, and it wastes the player's time. What's your position on random loot? Have you seen systems that do not suffer from the issues I have mentioned. Greetings, Wave of Kittens. There's also a question here for Paul, but we'll take this question first. So, as I understood the term ARPG, um, random loot drops was always a, a necessary ingredient. I'm not saying that your definition is wrong. I'm just saying that our terms are such a disaster that everybody has a different definition for every genre name that includes RPG in it, and so nobody knows what anybody's talking about. Um, random loot is is very much a some people love it, some people hate it. It is random rewards. If you get a shot of dopamine when something rare and exciting happens and you become I mean, I, I've done a video on the Skinner box before and I'll put it in the show notes, but it's basically random rewards for some segment of the population trigger dopamine and thus they will always be fun and you can play them for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours if you do not get dopamine from random drops then yes they w i cannot imagine how annoying that genre would be it's just endless busy work right it's like if you don't enjoy drinking alcohol it's like man i'm just keep going to these bars and people are just sitting right. here drinking alcohol what's the deal right <laughs> right um so for most people playing these games, like that's the central that's the central loop is go out, kill a bunch of stuff. That stuff will drop random stuff and sometimes you'll get rare things and that'll give you a blast of dopamine that feels good. Um yeah, so I don't know what else to say about this. Um it's almost like it's not even it's not bad design, it's just it is a gameplay feature that biologically can't ap appeal to everyone. Like I've seen people write on the, the blog and they keep trying these games because they keep hearing from everybody else how fun, how much fun everybody's having and they keep playing it and they're like, why do people like these games? I don't get it. <laughs> and it's like, you are immune to what this game has to offer. Which is generally a good thing. It means you're also immune to gambling addiction. And the fact that I like this genre suggests that I would be susceptible to gambling addiction. Hmm. You better watch out. Right. I try to avoid doing things that, that involve gambling for money or whatever. I mean, I've never, I've never played any game of chance for money ever. Just in case. Because I don't want to, you know. <laughs> Not even once. Is, right, exactly, exactly. And if I can get that high from from shooting bandits in Borderlands, well then, great, no problem. And you don't have to pay per bandit or per bullet. Oof, you just wait till they figure that one out. Right, I, I should say, yet. <laughs> they don't charge you by the <laughs> bullet yet. But they are certainly working on, They are is, the people at EA are currently trying to figure that out. How can we charge players by the bullet? All right, Paul, can you take this PS? 
P.S. for Paul. If Star Citizen is too much of a millionaire's space game, then how about Reassembly? It's a top-down space action game with strategy elements and a powerful ship builder. People are constantly uploading their fleets via integrated wormholes and uploading via integrated wormholes. And other players can then meet these so-called agents within the game. It's still very active, and there's a link. I did briefly look at this, and uh, it looks neat. I didn't see evidence of a deep uh, integrated shipbuilding system other than just it looks cool and the position of your guns is important. And uh, so that's kind of a drawback for me. Like if I'm going to engage with a design system, I want there to be at least some level of uh, systems interconnectedness that where it's important where you put things and how you connect them up and infrastructure matters and all that kind of stuff. Um, for example, Stormworks has pipes and things that carry fluids around and you have to plan around how to get things from here to there. It's not as deep as I'd like, but it's at least something. And it didn't look like Reassembly had that. Maybe I'm wrong, um, but yeah, it looks like a, a cute little game. Uh, I'm not too interested in the... I don't know. There's something about the top-down uh, spaceship thing. After after Kerbal Space Program, for me, like space games really do need to have either some sort of fantastical sci-fi element or some really hard orbital mechanics science stuff in it because if you just try to go like soft orbital mechanics it's not convincing anymore space curl space programs ruined that for me funny you brought that up uh Kerbal space program updated last month and i just got into it today that's what i did with my saturday my day off as i played ksp again Ooh. I actually, uh, Scott Manley had a video up recently on a mod for far future technologies. And I was like, oh, there's a new update, and that sounds like a cool mod. But I played all day, and I'm, you know, I, I started a new game. And I played all day, but I'm not up, I haven't gotten to the end of the tech tree yet, so I haven't gotten to far future technologies. So I haven't <laughs> done anything new. I just playing You've the same You've got the mod in, but you years. haven't actually used it yet. Right, because you got to get to the end. What changed in the recent update? There's a whole bunch of stuff. There's now inventory. Um, Kerbals can carry stuff and they can assemble things at a low, you know, you can have them land on a planet mm. and assemble. So I haven't touched it yet. I immediately read that and I was like, oh, wow, the game it really needed this. Like you kind of have yeah. to, if you want a, a building, at where you're going, you have to just oh, yeah. make it was a ship torturous or before. Yeah, which is ridiculous, and it's like it doesn't make any sense to have this giant pressurized vessel when reasonably you would go there and constr construct it on location. That's how this would work, and supposedly you can do that now. I'm not sure how flexible it is or what you can do. I'm still I'm still waiting to to get somewhere that is worth building something. Fun. Oh man, I gotta get in KSP again. I'm still I'm still working on my industry. I've almost conquered the entire planet, but not quite there yet. Dear Diecast, when you look at a studio's output, it seems like they are iterating toward a particular type of game. Over the last decade or so, Bioware has moved further and further toward the open world collectathon. From Software have pushed their games to be more focused on fast dodge parry play over the choose your own playstyle of their earlier games. And World of Warcraft, if you think of each new expansion as a game, is widely criticized for their theme parkification. What do you think drives these kind of shifts? And can you think of any of the other developers where you can describe a clear direction their games are moving in? 93. Thank you, 93, as always. Uh, what drives it, I'm sure, is feedback. You know, you make a game and you get a lot of feedback and, you know, it feels like 90% of the people like feature A and nobody mentions feature B. So when you design the, when you design the sequel, you're going to be like, well, we got to make sure to have lots of A in there and you don't have a lot of motivation to invest in B because it seems like people didn't care. Now, maybe they did, maybe they did care and they just didn't articulate it. You know, like, uh, 
I can think of a of a weird example of a game where this doesn't happen is Doom. Doom, I mean, it's changed over the years, but it doesn't feel like it's converted. It doesn't feel it, there aren't a bunch of mechanics in early Doom games that they threw away, right? They've still got like shooting monsters and occasionally secrets. Finding key cards, open doors to get to the next batch of murders and monsters. Hmm, yeah. Where like Elder Scrolls, um, over the years, they seem to be converging on a game about looting. Like they had all sorts of story stuff and big dialogue wheels and everything in their early games and lots of simulationist type systems. And now they are very much all Bethesda games are converging on this invade some sort of contained location, take all the stuff, drag it back to town and sell it or back to your back to your dragon horde and put it on display. That's the loop. That's what keeps people playing and that's what they seem to be investing in and anything that's not part of that loop is like oh i guess we need story maybe man you should just play as a dragon and have an actual literal <laughs> horde right um yeah so that's my guess is that it's feedback and they just do more of what other people whatever resonates with people and less of whatever doesn't get noticed the danger of that of course is that if you've got a feature that is needed to round out the game but doesn't get a lot of attention people might not make a fuss over it and so you might think it's not important mm, like yeah maybe if you're making a thief game with sprawling levels but people aren't constantly making a fuss over how big the levels are then maybe you'll think oh maybe we don't need big levels maybe we can make little closet levels and people will be okay with that I think it has to be at least partially also the developer urgency, the things that the developers are interested in, because that could also build off itself. You see a studio that's doing the kind of thing you want to do. You want to get hired by that studio. You push hard to get in. Maybe you make some, oh, some yeah. sacrifices in salary or whatever so that you can work on the games that you really love. Now there are more of those kind of people working there. And so it, it further develops that thing that people are interested in. Um, and then also probably tone at the top, right? The leaders of the company may be interested in one thing or the other, and so that's probably going to push the company in that direction. One that I thought was kind of weird was the recent Borderlands game, Borderlands 3. Hmm. They made a big fuss about how you're always getting... It was almost like they listened to the wrong feedback. They're like, okay, people <laughs> really like getting loot. They love getting random loot. So let's just have everything drop tons and tons of loot. And that will give people more of what they want. But of course, it just... It amps it up so that nothing feels special. If... In Borderlands 2, an orange item will drop every few hours, maybe. Maybe, maybe once a play session. In Borderlands 3, it's like every fourth person you gun down drops an orange item. So, you no longer get a blast of dopamine. Nothing feels rare. There's no texture to it. There's no spikes of exotic items or, or notable moments. It's like a roller coaster that tries to be all the top of the hill all the time. And now you know what Wave of Kittens feels like. Right. Yeah, I don't I don't I'm not familiar enough with uh, a broad range of studios to be able to chart this out. So I I think your summary is probably best. Uh you have a much better finger on the pulse of the industry and, and different studios and stuff. I don't even think I really I think you could explore this question a lot more than I have thinking about other studios that are converging on a particular place. I mean, obviously that's happened to Ubisoft. That's an entire publisher that's converged on a particular design and they've just decided, okay, this is our house style. This is what we make. We make cheeseburgers. <laughs> and then there's like EA games where you wish they would just converge on one thing and leave everyone else alone. <laughs> Can you guys pick one area to ruin and just ruin that and leave everything else alone? 
Yeah, you're making money with FIFA, just stick to what you know. Dear DieCast, I pull in the latest updates for my system twice a week, and about a week ago it included an up-to-date kernel and graphics drivers. All right, this person doesn't say so, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I'll bet you're a Linux user. <laughs> I am a fan of new things and I immediately rebooted and I was astounded at how snappy and responsive my system was. You know, this just, this makes me angry. Here's a person that updates their computer twice a week and it improves their computer. This is me like, oh no, please don't make me update, don't make me update. I do them once every six months and it always breaks something and it's horrible. <laughs> it breaks my workflow. <laughs> I yeah, can't remember yeah. the last time I got a Windows update that improved my computer at all. I cannot remember a single improvement in years. Uh, it, it's the, the light side and the dark side of the computer updates. Right. There must be balance. But it's also that, you know, the difference between open source and closed source. Like if, yeah. if, if open source people knew how to compete with Microsoft on Microsoft's turf and didn't have to make their own ghetto of like, well, we're technically as good as Microsoft. We're just incompatible with everything they do because they deliberately make themselves incompatible with us. Yeah. If the, if it would be a very different world and maybe, maybe there would be something that, that runs at, that is as compatible as windows, but that works more like, Linux in terms of, hey, a new update is out and I'm not terrified. <laughs> Maybe it'll be something good. <laughs> Maybe it won't break my workflow. <clears throat> Back to this email. Fast forward to the weekend, I booted up a game. Now, up until that point, I had only ever experienced it at 30 frames a second. And I was very disoriented when it ran at a nice smooth 60 frames a second. As I wasn't used to this kind of buttery smooth performance, the game felt really weird to play. So I started to wonder, have you guys experiencing like, experienced something like this, going from 30 to 60, or from 60 to 144, and being a bit weirded out by how silky smooth the experience is? Vale, Tim. So yeah, I feel like, you go first, Paul, because I feel like I've talked about this within the last year. Yeah, I, I don't generally play uh, a lot of um, first-person, like, response action snappy kind of stuff and so the frame rate doesn't matter so much to me um <laughs> right if you got 200 frames a second in ministry how would you notice right uh so so i i don't generally get weirded out by that just because that's not the kind of game that i'm i'm generally into um but whenever i whenever i buy a new computer i always run some blender tests on it and so that's kind of the the thing where it's like how how well can this thing handle a big scene with a bunch of cubes or you know a bunch of particle systems or the physics or whatever and you know try it out kind of run it through its paces and see like how responsive does the does the software remain given the uh given the system but uh that doesn't usually change a lot with with graphics card updates and stuff and, and drivers i don't think anyway but I also run Windows, so maybe they're they're already as good as they're going to get, or or they're slowly getting worse over time. I think it was about two years ago now that I someone donated a computer to me, and this was brand new, top of the line. And the previous computer I had was top of the line in 2012. So I went from a a really good computer in 2012 to a really good computer in 2018. And at the time, I remember being really shocked at what an upgrade it was. In the old machine, I I would sometimes get above 50, 60. Or I would sometimes get 60 frames a second, but I used to tell everybody I can't tell the difference between 30 and 60 now. And looking back, I'm going to assume it was probably my monitor just could not go faster than 30. So, you know, the game was running super silky smooth, but it was physically impossible for me to see that result. Seems weird, but okay. Right. I thought it was weird, too. Like, what kind of monitor wouldn't go better than 30? But, you know, I would. I'd... I'd, I'd crank a game up to 60 and I could not see the difference. I couldn't even tell the difference between 60 and 30. 
but I plugged into the new computer, which came with a brand new monitor, and wow, Im immediately I could tell the difference. And yeah, I can tell the difference between 30 and 60, and I can go all the way up to 144, and I can tell the difference between 60 and 144. And yeah, it is wonderful, and I do like I. I thought I was just too old to see the frames. I assumed, hey, I'm nearly 50. My old eyes can't keep up. It doesn't matter to me. I'm happy at 30 frames a second. But no, in the last couple of years, I've become a frame rate snob. And I really, I can feel it when, when I dip below 60 and land at 30. And I, you know, when I'm at 30, I'm like, oh, I really wish I could reach 60. That feels so much better. Cyberpunk is the game I've been playing lately that is like, oh, I'm getting 60 frames a second, but then you get in a weird part of town or a weird situation, things get heavy, you know, combat situation, and it'll go down to like, you know, below 30, and wow, suddenly I can't shoot straight, everything feels awful. It's really bad. So, yeah, it's easy to become spoiled. But you haven't encountered something where, like Tim's describing, where the frame rate went up and it felt weird. It's always been a positive oh. experience, higher frame rate. I mean, it was. When I went to 60, I was like, oh, this is so... It, it, it feels a little weird. And I remember back in the 90s, the first time I, w I went for really high frame rate in Quake 1. Back in the day when, you know, your CRT could do... Just ridiculous frame rates, much more than video games could normally keep up with back then. And I feel, you know, felt 60 frames a second for the first time. And I remember how weird it felt at the time. So yeah, I have had that sensation, but for me, it never lasts that long. It's always like five minutes of, wow, this is amazing. And then like after those five minutes, you're perfectly acclimated to it and it must be this. And if you dip below that later, it immediately feels awful. Like you just go from, this is amazing to taking it for granted in under, in under an hour. It's ridiculous. Ah, uh, yes. Entitled first world problems. Yep. 60 FPS or GTFO. <laughs> well, Paul, um, according to my calculations, we've done a show. All right. Well, we used to ask people to send in an email, uh, but now you can contact us via Meet Now. <laughs> Message the show on Microsoft Meet Now. The button's in the toolbar. Just press the button. Just press the button. You don't need to think anymore. Don't type things. Just press the button that Microsoft told you to press. Give them your personal information. <laughs> Let them dig their hooks into all your personal information. And then everything will be effortless. And you'll just press the button. Push the button, Gordon. Anyway, if you want to do the things the old way, you could send us a primitive email at diecast at shamusyoung.com, which is incidentally the only way that will answer it. But it's still the old way. Anyway, thanks to everyone who sent in questions. Say see you later, Paul. See you later. And oh, by the way, I actually did catch that pun and I'm angry at you.
that was the worst outro ever. Can I get a do-over? Sure. No, that was the stinger. Oh, great. <laughs>